Okay, so here we go. Welcome to We'll Figure It Out. Today on We'll Figure It Out, I have a special guest. Their name is Nos, right? Nos? Is that Either. how you pronounce it? Nos. Okay. Their name is Nos. They are very special to me. They are 20 years my junior, and they look very similar to me because they are my sis- my sister. Can I call you my sister too? <laughs> like that's just my. They are my sibling. There you go. There we go. And I am going to be trying my hardest to respect my siblings' pronouns because it is a new thing for me to address my sibling as they them and I I really want to try and respect her pronouns and her chosen name so please forgive me if I make any misgivings I will try to correct myself as we go but please I welcome to the podcast Nose. dozen people who listen hopefully it's seven. more <laughs> hopefully it's more hopefully it's more she is also in the background my editor for most of our episodes and today we are going to be talking about chronic pain i have some experience with it mine has been pretty much my whole entire life since about puberty and Nose has been going through it recently, um, the last couple of years, I guess more. It's been about seven years since the first chronic pain mm-hmm. thing, but mm-hmm. the last two or so have been the worst. Right, right. So it's kind of flared up, I guess, in the mm-hmm. last couple of years to the point where where they have needed some extra supports and they have moved back home. So I'm very glad to have Nos around again and be able to spend some time with them. So we are, I guess what we need to start with is kind of your diagnosis journey and I guess how the chronic pain started for you and how old you were and that kind of thing. Okay. So it's a little complicated because I have two different conditions. So Mm -hmm. I have endometriosis, which basically started at puberty. Endometriosis is basically a condition where the tissue that's supposed to only grow inside your uterus also grows outside of it, all over your pelvic cavity, even all over your body. Thankfully, it's confined to my pelvic cavity in my case. Uh, But basically what happens is you just have really, really severe period cramps. Thankfully, that's under control, so I tend to forget that it was even ever a condition in the first place. Right. Um, But technically, I've been dealing with that since I was about 14, so Mm -hmm. I've been dealing with chronic pain for seven years at this point. Mm -hmm. Uh, But when it really got bad, I'm trying to think. I know this timeline, but dates get confusing. Was it when you quit working with the nursery at Oshel's? It was kind of before that. I okay. had, like, I would have pain when I would first wake up in the morning, like, just all over my body, my joints, but it would kind of go away once I started getting moving. Mm-hmm. I had a pretty physical job. I was aid at a preschool, so I was on my feet five hours a day. I was lifting kids. I was cleaning. And then that job was... um. It was one of those small businesses that really isn't run very well, and they made some really bad management decisions, and I decided to leave because I was tired of being treated badly. So I've kind of gone back and forth on whether it started while I was working there or whether I got worse afterwards. It's kind of hard to tell. But within about a month of quitting the job, I was living with my other sister in Florida, in an upstairs room and I started having to like ration the number of times I went up and down the stairs because the pain in my legs was so bad I could barely walk. So I didn't really know what to do. I went to doctors. I got vaguely diagnosed with fibromyalgia, which is the thing they do when they're like, hmm, well, something's wrong with you, but I don't know what. So I'm just going to give you fibromyalgia. It's a nice blanket diagnosis. So fast forward another year and I've 
moved all over the country. My health is still not doing great. I still haven't been able to hold down a job. And I think I figured it out. I thought briefly that I had uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder that affects basically your entire body. It affects collagen production, and your collagen is in your muscles. It's in everything. It can mm-hmm. affect almost everything. So I got an appointment with an EDS specialist in North Carolina. And he said I didn't have EDS, but I did have chronic fatigue syndrome. Um so that was when I finally got a name. It's mm-hmm. unfortunately one of those big shrug, we don't know what's wrong diagnoses. CFS has only been really on the medical radar for about 40 years, and they're still not sure what causes it. They're still not sure how to fix it. The only real treatment is treating symptoms and hoping that something sticks and eventually you go into remission. So basically the best way to describe what it's like to live with CFS is imagine you have the flu 24-7. So on bad days, I feel like I have a really bad flu, like I'm running a high fever, not literally, but I feel like I'm running a really high fever. I feel extremely run down. I feel exhausted. I don't want to do anything. I can barely get out of bed. On good days, I feel like I'm recovering from the flu. Mm -hmm. So still not great. Like but you, I don't have the flu. <laughs> right. Like, okay, I have the energy to do a few things, but if you right. do a few things, you're wiped out. Right. And right. one of the biggest, the two basically defining symptoms of CFS are um, what's called post-exertional malaise. Mm-hmm. So after any exertion, and that's physical, that's emotional, that's even mental, you get into a malaise Mm -hmm. you just you feel bad you feel exhausted you feel way more tired than you should Um, and my pain also gets worse along with that so and then it's non-restorative sleep is the other one so literally no matter how much I sleep I never feel truly rested there are definitely (laughs) some days I mean a lot of people have this experience Um, especially parents every mom ever is listening and going like yeah okay tell me something I don't know right right. Um, yeah but but there are people out there who actually sleep and they wake up and they feel rested I don't know who they are but they exist (laughs) um I have yet to meet one but to be fair my circles are very chronic illness leaning right or you know like hyper focus driven where you know (laughs) Your family all has ADHD and they drive themselves to exhaustion. Not a single normal person in our family. No, no. I, I do not think we have a neurotypical person in our family. No. So basically, I have a lot of joint pain. I have a lot of back pain. I'm not housebound, which I am grateful for like every single day because yeah. if I had... I'm, like, on the edge. If my CFS gets any worse, I could potentially become housebound. Um, Mm -hmm. But right now I have a moderate case. So right now I'm not housebound. Uh, I have a moderate case of CFS, which, you know, moderate case of my disease is feeling like I have the flu all the time. So you can imagine how bad a severe case is. Right. Um, Yeah. So basically, let's see. I got diagnosed almost a year ago. Mm Mm-hmm. And the recommendation at the time was to go to a very expensive clinic that does not work with insurance in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, I didn't have any money, nor did I have the time to deal with that at the time. Mm -hmm. So I pretty much went almost a year without any real treatment. And now I'm really starting to actually pursue treatment. I moved back home so that I could not. My choice was basically either work and never address my health or address Mm -hmm. my health and don't work. And so I thought, you know. Maybe I should move home and uh, actually fix my health so that hopefully I can get back into the workforce eventually. Right, um, right. To be able and not continue to run yourself down. Right. Because I, mm-hmm. you know, with my disease, the the more you push yourself, the deeper in the hole you get. And I was basically right on the edge of mm-hmm. pushing myself into a severe case. And I'm not really interested in having severe CFS if I right. can help it. Right. Yeah, uh, let's avoid that, right? <laughs> like, that train needs to be, you know, like, we need to derail that train. Put the on. <clears throat> Put the shovel down. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's choose a different course for this train. Okay, so, you know, Nos is my sibling. We did not really grow up a whole lot together because of the 20-year difference. 
when she was born, I was getting ready to go to Korea for a year. So I missed like the whole first year of her life. I think I still have one of the little cards or letters that you sent me while you were in Korea. Oh, really? Oh my God. That's so cool. (laughs) You know, her, her, her birth was very traumatic for myself and especially for my mom. Has mom ever told you the story? Did she lose a lot of blood when I was Yeah, born? she almost died. I don't think I heard the almost died part. You didn't? No. No, she's she pretty much told the nurse. I was in the room and it was basically, you know, my mom let me be a part of the birth and everything because I was getting ready to leave for a year and I that would be like the only real time I had to bond with you. And um I was in the room and she had just, well, I wasn't like there when she gave birth to you, but I was kind of like there mm-hmm. before, there after mm-hmm. kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And she had lost so much fluid and she told the nurse, I think I'm going to die. Wow. And they, she, the nurse was really calm and collected, but I could tell by the hurriedness mm-hmm. of her like getting the fluids and like jamming them into my mom. Like she was just squeezing the cold bags oh, of fluid man. into mom. And um, I could I could just see in mom's face. And dad wasn't in the room. Dad was with you. Oh, I'm so glad he wasn't. <clears throat> I know. Because dad is not good with medical stuff at all. And I could just see mom's face was just losing all color. And oh, wow. um it was very scary. I yeah, was Yeah, that sounds terrifying. I was 20 years old and I was getting ready to leave and my grandfather on my dad's side had just had a stroke mm-hmm. like a week or two before you were born. And so we had all of this family stuff going on, yeah. right? We had my grandfather who had, was in the hospital with a stroke or had just got home, something like that. My mom was, you know, pregnant with my sister. She, you know, she almost died when, you know, she gave birth to Nos. And it was, it was very true. And then like a week or two later, I leave to go to Korea for a year. And then while I was in Korea, our cousin, um, Earl. Oh, he died after I was born? Yeah. He was, um, he was sick with leukemia. They found out while I was in Korea and I came home. Wow. I came home. I did I did meet you, you know, like after that, mm-hmm. like when you were six months old mm-hmm. about. So I think it was in February or January, February of that year. So that would have been 2000. So, um, right? Would that have been 2000? Yes. yes because, it would yeah, it would have been 2000. So I was born in July. Yeah. So. The beginning of 2000, I came back home somewhere between January and February and I got to see my cousin for the last time, and he passed away after a bone marrow Man. transplant didn't take. So it's a really move fast in our family, except for I guess Grandpa. Um. Well, I guess with Granny, it was just that they didn't catch it until it was yeah it was stage four, really advanced. and she was eighty, so yeah. she wasn't going to go through treatment. That year was pretty traumatic for our family. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, although a lighthearted story to yeah, like yeah. To break it up is that since I was born right around the time my grandfather had a stroke, he wanted to see me mm-hmm. so badly. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, I don't remember this because I was an infant, right. um, but what they would do is they would come and mama put me in my baby carrier on the kitchen table. Mm-hmm. and he was having a really hard time doing his physical therapy. He didn't really want to, so they would put me on the kitchen table, and they would tell him, Ned, you can see her if you get up and walk to the kitchen. Yep. And he would do it. <clears throat> and I think we have one home video of me. My grandparents had just all these family pictures that line the hallway, mm-hmm. and he used to put me on his lap in his wheelchair, and Momo would push him down the hallway, and he would tell me who all the people were. Yep, you're uh-huh. about two or three when he did that. I remember. Oh, tiny. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. They they had a special bond, them two, and uh, he stuck around for her. Um, I, I don't think if it wasn't for, for you, he, I mean, we were all grown. Right. I mean, Nick wasn't yet, but, you know, he had had our his time with us, you right, know? He's right. like, he hadn't met you yet, so he stuck around for you. He he just couldn't hang with it anymore. He, the d- dialysis was, was really hard for him. So after that, he was just like, I'm ready. So 
Um, but yeah, no, they had a sweet relationship. It was really, when I came back home, I guess you were three when I finally left the Air Force or two. You were two. But then I would come home when I was in Florida every once in a while. Anyway, yeah, that was, that's a sweet little memory. (laughs) Family history tangent. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, trauma does run in our family, doesn't it? It super does. I didn't realize my birth was that. I'm sorry I exposed that to you. No, I I think (laughs) mom has told me the story before, but I'm not sure. She may not have. She doesn't. She likes to minimize things sometimes. Mm -hmm. Not that. Oh, yeah. She, I think she doesn't want to scare anybody Mm -hmm. of what the reality was. I feel like she's told me the story. I don't remember if she told me it was when I was born, but it's possible. I have this wish she's memory. It's possible she's told me the whole Mm -hmm. story before. Mm -hmm. I just don't remember. Right. Um, Right. And hearing yeah. it for somebody on the outside is yeah. probably different, too. Yeah. Yeah. So my chronic pain story pretty much started when I developed breasts because my, our family has um, genes of very endowed <laughs> breasts. We and... really do. Even tiny me. <laughs> so I was like a double D when I was in eighth grade. <clears throat> and I'm 5'2". And I've been 5'2 since forever. It's a lot of breasts to have on a small stature. And so I had chronic back pain. And then I also have always had like chronic knee pain, which recently I found out I have arthritis. I mean, like in the last 10 years, I have arthritis on my knees. And I was like 35 when I was diagnosed. Knee problems also run in our family. They do. They do. What is with that? I don't know. It's genes. It's the way you anything, I find out I have something. I know I have something going on with my knees, but like something yeah. diagnosable for right. sure is happening in there. <laughs> yeah, I have um I have a torn a slightly torn meniscus in my right knee. Um is that what mom had? Dad. Dad had Dad had a torn meniscus. Yeah. His was worse. He had Man, a surgery. Mom really has bad knee jeans. Mom has a cyst, I think, in her mm-hmm. knee. Bad knee jeans. Yeah, bad knee jeans. I don't know. I guess that does. I'm trying to think of who else had bad knees. Not Nick. He got hips. Right? <laughs> Poor guy. It's a trauma. I don't know. So, yeah, I've had chronic back pain since I was 13, I guess. And then um, I had an injury when I was working at a restaurant as a bus person. And I had sciatica for years. Oof. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons that I, when I went into the Air Force, I was enlisted as security forces. And when my back was acting up when I was in training, I got reclassified. Not that they actually reclassified me to something that wasn't going to hurt my back, but I got reclassified. And then I wound up finding an office job within that reclassification. Nice. Nice. (laughs) Which did help, but, you know, it wasn't until, like, 10 years later. I'm I'm trying to think. So that was 97. About five years later, I finally went to a chiropractor and started getting adjustments and stuff. And since then, as long as I get regular adjustments, I never have any issues with the sciatica. Yeah. And the – I have – I have hip pain. I've always had hip pain on my right. Um, I think my pelvis is tilted. I don't know. I also have hip pain in my right hip. Do we get tilted pelvis jeans too? We might have. So I know that when I was pregnant for Samuel, I had, he was a breech presentation. Yes, that was so fun. And he even flipped over again after they tried to invert him. (laughs) Little stubborn child. Always, always. He, he let his stubbornness be known. Strong maternal and paternal genes. Yes. Those family genes are very strong with us. And when I had Jonathan, I I had a C-section for both Samuel and Jonathan. And then when I got pregnant a couple years later with Noah, I was like, okay, I want to go get it, regular adjustments. Mm-hmm. And I think she may have told me something about my pelvis being tilted or mm. out of alignment or something. But then I was able to have a natural birth with him. So I'm like, I attribute that to the fact that my pelvis was out of whack. And she made it in whack. So I could. Maybe so. Maybe so. You know? Who knows? Who knows? knows? So, um, but I do have also a sway back 
my lower back is it was very swayed when I was a, a child. I used to get made fun of for it. Man. Yeah. Um, I was also in gymnastics. I don't know if that exacerbated it. Well, but might not have helped. Yeah. I yeah, I used to I walk out, you know, I used to just walk and people would be like, Why are you sticking your chest out? You have no boobs and I'm like, I'm not. I'm just walking. <laughs> And I had no idea. Right. Like, it was just normal to me to right. walk like that. My posture was. Right. And then I think finally when I went to the chiropractor, they took x-rays. And I'm like, oh, wow. My lower back really is curved. No wonder. You know? And then looking back on, like, pictures and stuff, mm-hmm. I could see how I was standing like that. And I was like, somebody probably should have brought me to physical therapy for that. <laughs> I probably could have gotten, you know, some help with the lower back pain with some physical therapy. Maybe. Who knows? You know, but not that I would probably do it when I was younger either. Yeah, that's the clincher. Yeah. We're kind of stubborn that way. I still don't know if the reason my knee still hurts is because I didn't finish physical therapy. (laughs) (laughs) I went, eh, good enough. And then it, you know, healed after another couple of months and now it still hurts. So did it really heal? I don't know. I mean, once you have an injury, sometimes it's it's your body doesn't go back. Yeah, I've to... heard that happens in your thirties, uh, but apparently for me, it happened in my teens. Mm-hmm. My body doesn't like healing. No, no, some some bodies don't. Um, so that you know, and then I would hmm, when I was coming back and forth from the different stations I was at. I was in um, Shreveport for a while, Shreveport Bossier. And I would five and a half hour drive home. It would be really, really hard on my back. Yeah. Um, and then when I was in um, Panama City, Florida, that was another like five, five and a half hour drive. Again, Oof. yeah, hard on my back. Um, and then I'm trying to think, it just seemed like every time I started to try and like exercise, my body would go, "No, you're gonna get injured." Hmm. The only I don't time. Know how that yeah, the only time it ne- it did not happen is when I gradually, like, I started with, like, a 30-second workout every day for a week, and then I went to a minute. And then, I, like, my kids were little, so I was like, I could work out for 30 seconds a day, yeah. and then I can add a minute, you know? And so, like, the gradual build up to that, and then I started, like, teaching Pio exercises. I remember that. And that was, like, the only time that... I had, like, exercised on the regular and never injured myself until I went to go check out a car one day, and I reached behind me, and I tore my labral, my my labrum, yeah, on my right shoulder, and my right shoulder has not been the same since. So, yeah, I have chronic pain in in my arm, and then now I have two bulging discs in my neck. I have no idea how that happened. And that was, that started, that actually started, um, about two years ago, right before I went and had my breast reduction. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, my double D's like tripled. And so I don't even remember what size I was before my breast reduction, (laughs) but I do have a video about it. I need to do an update. I haven't done an update about that in a long time. I got a breast video about it. Go check out her YouTube. Yeah. Mom of boys, Nola. So I did, I wound up getting, I th- that was like one of the best decisions I could have ever made. And then when I was laid up, rep- recovering from that, my neck got better. And oh. then mm. <clears throat> for a year and a half, I was doing a lot better. And then all of a sudden, like I started having nerve pain in my oh. arm and in my ear and oh, that's the down worst. my, the front of my chest. And then like, I have these random nerve pains that go all the, over my body every once in a while. I have no idea if it's related to my discs, but I haven't, I'd never experienced any of this before. You know, I started mm-hmm. having the neck pain. There's spinal cords in there. They might be pinching something. Maybe. I don't know. So when I got my x-rays, my neck, well, two years ago when I got x-rays, my vertebrae were standing one on top of the other. Mm-hmm. Your cervical spine is supposed to have a natural curve, you know, where right. it curves towards your um, throat, right? And it doesn't have that. <clears throat> or it didn't. I don't know if it doesn't anymore, but I mean, I don't know if it's fixed itself, but, and then, you know, like I was on anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxers, gabapentin mm-hmm. for the nerve pain, um, which, oh my gosh, I, nobody can function on gabapentin. I don't know why they give that to people, but um, I couldn't, I couldn't even think to like work. So I had to take myself off of it. Noted. And, 
I won't mess with that. You know, I mean, I guess maybe some people don't have that effect, but... Uh, side effects affect people differently. And right. some people might not care. Honestly, some days, if I could take a pill that knocked me out... You would be happy. I would be fine, you know. Right, yeah. I'm fine, sure. I'll <laughs> take a really long nap. Right, I know. If I didn't have kids and work, that would be fine, but, you know, I've got those, so... Yeah, unfortunate. <laughs> you know, so... That's been since November that I was dealing with that. I'm much better now and I can get a lot more done. I mean, besides the fact that I had a cold and, you know, my voice is like all weird right now. So apologize for that. (laughs) That nasally, you know, it does. It does. And then, you know, I think because my vitamin D is so low, Mm -hmm. I'm having a harder time recovering from this illness than Yeah, vitamin D is very useful. Like all the vitamins that we're supposed to have in our bodies. Right, right. So I want to get that checked again. But, I wish I could um, give you some of my extra. Right? I have so much extra. Did I tell you that? You, well, you just told me all your labs. When you picked up your labs, mm-hmm. I asked you what your number was. It was like uh, almost 40 over the high normal. And they didn't bother to tell me my vitamin D was too high. Well, I don't think it can be really necessarily too high. And you can. You can get vitamin yeah. D toxicity. Oh, can if you? I had If I had kept taking the dose I was at uh, for long enough, I could have had some pretty serious issues. Well, you know, my doctor didn't call me and tell me mine was dangerously low either. So. Doctors. Do better. Yeah. You know, I talked to my chiropractor about it and she's like, oh, I have some supplements. Here, take those. I'm like, <laughs> okay. And I started feeling better. And, you know, one of the things Nas and I have – talked about is the correlation between vitamin D deficiency and chronic pain Mm -hmm. and how it can having lower vitamin D levels can make your chronic pain exacerbated. Yeah, I actually, when I first started taking vitamin D, it doesn't do this for me anymore, sadly, but it used to be I would get up in the morning and my whole body would hurt. I'd take my vitamin D and within about an hour... (sighs) hour and a half my pain would be significantly reduced i don't know what it was about the vitamin d that did that but i really wish it would do that again Mm -hmm. love to have that happen again right would love to have a reduction in my pain just from taking my vitamin d right unfortunately right your body got used to having it so it was like no we're not gonna do that reject it maybe it'll happen to me with my b shots eventually yeah maybe so right now they nerf me nerf yes sorry that's uh (laughs) Gen Z talk. Right now, they, they um, <laughs> significantly impair my function. I, I learned a new term. Awesome. I'm cool. <laughs> I can say it nerfed me, and I'm going to be the cool mom. I love it. Thank you. Use that on your kids. <laughs> I'm going to. <laughs> I think Samuel's used that before, and I'm like, hmm, probably, yeah. Whatever. Oh, man. All right. So tell me about, like, the process that I guess you went through, you know, because basically my generation, um, I'm kind of like the micro generation between Mm -hmm. X and millennials, right? And mainly a lot of Generation X and boomers, it's basically you just, you, you work through it, you push through, and it doesn't matter. You know, how much pain you have, you have to do what you have to do, and there's no excuses. So that's kind of how I've always... Hold, please. (laughs) Okay. What are we talking about? The manumanups? No. (laughs) (laughs) Manumanup. I love that. Everybody's like, what is that ringtone? It's a great ringtone. It's like mom's baby laugh text notification. I set my phone on vibrate all the time because I get too many Discord notifications. <laughs> my phone would constantly be making noise and I'm just not into that. Mm-hmm. You were talking about generational attitudes. Oh, yeah, That's we, we were. were. We were. Okay, so mine was basically push through, mm-hmm. you know, maybe go to the doctor and get some meds for it to be able to function. Right. But... It wasn't, let's find out what's wrong and fix it. It was, how can we function still with it? You know, and, and there are no excuses. And it was really hard trying to explain chronic back pain to people. And they're like, well, I had this injury and I did still did this. And I'm like, you're super freaking man. Good for you. But it's wiping me out. I'm glad that you're a healthy person. Not all of us are. Right? And I would like, I get off of work. I could remember when I was in the Air Force, I would get off at work when I was in um, Shreveport 
And I would go into the dorms and the physical therapist basically was like, okay, when you're in a lot of pain, do this. And it was, I would lay on my back and I would put my feet on my Mm -hmm. bed because it was about that 90 degree angle. And that was the only way I could, I mean, I was on 800 milligrams of Motrin three times a day for years. And I would still, at the end of the day, get to the- Motrin doesn't do anything for Uh, chronic pain. You know, it really, I mean, it might take the edge off for a while, but your body gets used to it after a while and it doesn't help anymore. And, and it's like when you're on 800 milligrams mm-hmm. and you're in excruciating pain, what else do you do? Like, what can you take then? Right. You know, like Tylenol? I don't know if it's going to do anything. So that was, you know, it's like I would go and I would lay down and I would put my feet up. And that was the only time I could get relief right. from the pain enough to, like, not want to cry, you know? So, and I was in physical therapy forever and they did ultrasound therapy and they did, you know, exercises and... And I've always struggled with weight. You know, I know some that's part of the problem, but... Honestly, chronic pain and weight don't correlate as much as people think they do. Mm-hmm. Like, if you don't ever get into that, there's a whole bunch of nonsense about weight that we've been taught that isn't true. Mm-hmm. Um, if you ever want to get really mad, look into how many of the studies on weight making your health worse are funded by uh, biased people who want to continue selling diet culture, basically. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't think I want to do that. I don't want to be that no. mad. Yeah. Let's... But the short version is newer studies funded, you know, not by diet companies down mm. low, have actually shown that being overweight, in quotation marks, can actually protect your – it protects your organs. It can protect your heart. It improves your heart health. As opposed to like the traditional, oh, if you have too much weight, you're at risk for, et cetera, et cetera. It really. I'm guessing it depends on body type and depends. BMI. It does. Yeah. Um, and we'll get into all of it, but if that's you, another podcast for another day. If you ever want a diet culture uh, debunking okay. podcast? Let me know, and oh, I will man. get all of the sources and okay, stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, guys. Well, let us know. <laughs> like seriously, come find us on the social medias. Um, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, Mama Boys Nola, you know, say like, hey, yeah, let, let us do the, do the research. And we want to know about the diet culture because how many people are affected by, well, you're overweight and you're not going to be healthy. It's really bad. And if we can debunk that and let people be like, you're okay, Mm -hmm. you're fine the way you are. Wouldn't that be amazing? Body neutrality or even... Body positivity, if you can get there. But <laughs> the first step is just to feel neutral about your body. Right. Not negative. Right. Um, well, that would be a new thing for me. But yeah, into like the whole how I basically processed and got to sort of the acceptance phase with my chronic illness. Um, I know for, I'm not sure how true this is for millennials because I'm not a millennial. I'm, um, I'm a fun generation in between where people can't decide if i'm gen z or i'm a millennial uh, but i don't really relate to millennials other than we're all poor so <laughs> i'm living with your parents <laughs> yeah. yeah uh we're all poor it was really funny my brother who is fully a millennial uh, mm-hmm. i was talking to him when i was moving across the country last year and he was like i'm so glad that you also get the experience of being in college and trying to find jobs in the middle of a recession like yeah it's mm-hmm. great that it keeps happening over and over mm-hmm. so it's that a cycle. all of us in our 20s right. can have this wonderful experience yeah um but anyway that's not related <laughs> <laughs> another podcast but for another day <laughs> in general i feel like millennials and especially gen z tend to have a much healthier attitude towards mental health and mm-hmm. physical health where you know i know we're a lot more therapy positive we're mm-hmm. a lot more like mm, growing up kind of messed us up let's do something about that mm-hmm. so i think in general it was kind of in my head a fight between the way i was raised which um my mom didn't really believe that i was in as much pain as i said i was in she didn't believe me either. Yeah. I, you know, and I, like I honestly, it's it's hard when you're young to explain what's happening, especially because if it starts as young as it did for both of us, mm-hmm. it feels normal. 
mm-hmm. I didn't realize until, oh, I don't know, this year, I'm nearly 22, that most people don't have back pain in high school. That's right. That's not normal. Right. I mean, you might have temporary back pain because you're carrying a book bag that's too heavy, but most people don't have chronic permanent back pain like in daily their high school years you know yeah um, on the pain scale at least five and above right. every day right yeah um but like <clears throat> i didn't even i don't think i ever even mentioned being in back pain to mom like it didn't it didn't register for me right so, it was just you know, how you felt all the time what well, was that different yeah right and i know she also struggles with health issues and i think one of the biggest things that happens in that kind of generational cycle of we've all struggled with this issue is it does become normal Mm -hmm. and so if you don't ever realize as like the parent or even the grandparent that what you're experiencing isn't normal then when your child comes to you and describes it it sounds normal to you right because no one ever told you it wasn't normal for you right oh i deal with that all the time and i'm fine so why can't you be right yeah so it's it's not even like at the personal level it's mm-hmm. at the the systemic level of people need to learn that mm-hmm. these things aren't normal and nobody mm-hmm. can learn if nobody is teaching and it's like right. in our family neurodivergence is <laughs> run rampant mm-hmm. um and when i first was trying to figure out if i have adhd which i don't my mom suddenly went oh oh <laughs> like this is what i've been dealing with Right. But it was normal to her. So she never right. noticed that the things I was doing were abnormal either because it was, she did the same thing. She struggled with some of the same things. And then so did most of her children. Right. So did most of her children. <laughs> so did most of her grandchildren. Like right. it was never, when you have a family that's neurodivergent from top to bottom, right. nobody's there to go, what's wrong with you? Right. Like, what? Right. <laughs> what is going on? <coughs> um. So I definitely, I think, kind of ignored my pain for a while and just pushed it away. And, you know, there's the ever-present, I was out of shape, which I wasn't. Like, when I I really genuinely started getting sick, I had been working, Mm -hmm. like, 25-hour weeks out of preschool, which isn't, you know, 40-hour weeks. But, still, but for I was, you, because right, that was a yeah. lot compared to what I had been doing before, and Correct. I, I gained a lot of muscle. Like yeah. I was briefly very strong. <laughs> you know, even just standing on your feet for five hours a day, like mm-hmm. I almost never had the time to sit down. I was constantly mm-hmm. lifting kids. Like I was pretty healthy, right? Um, in quotation marks. So, like when it first happened, when I first had like a big crash and I was in constant pain and I couldn't really do anything. Mm-hmm. I, I really thought it was just going to go away. Right. Because that's what everybody thinks when you first start developing a chronic condition because you have no, no. idea what's going on. Right. So you're suddenly, like, way incapacitated, and you're like, well. I must have just overdone it. Right. Like, right? Yeah. Something, something's wrong, but I don't know what it is. And mm-hmm. so, it, surely, if I figure out the right thing, if I do the right things, it will all go away. Mm-hmm. And, like, I, through the two years of being – disabled because that's what I am I've done a lot of connection with the fellow disabled people in the disabled community and one of the things that really plagues our society is the idea that if you can do the right things Mm -hmm. you'll stay healthy Mm -hmm. and if you do the right things when you get sick you'll get better Mm -hmm. and so it's this constant thing in the back of your head even when you're dealing with a chronic illness and you know it's not your fault Mm -hmm. that if you could just do the right things if you could find the right combinations of little levers to switch in your body chemistry you'd be fine again Mm -hmm. when that's not how these things work like with you know with your chronic pain some of it is from like a lifetime of just things being out of whack and that Mm -hmm. a is not your fault and Mm -hmm. b there's only so much you can do if you don't get rid of the root cause right right? so before you had a breast reduction like your chronic back pain was only going to get so much better oh yeah it was never going to be resolved right yeah even afterwards because you dealt with it for so long it's Mm -hmm. it may never fully go away because no i mean i still have lower back pain i mean but i also have a sway back so it's like it basically my back pain was just exacerbated by the large breasts right and I've reduced some of the strain on my back, but I, I don't know if I'll ever not deal with it because 
I would have to probably get scoliosis surgery right. to fix the curve in my back enough. But is it, it's not debilitating me. I mean, I don't think the it ever. would probably be more trouble and yeah. more expensive yeah. than just dealing with pain. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. They're like, you know, $80,000 just yeah. for the, the neurosurgeon's time. <laughs> <laughs> so like it, the kind of, <clears throat> I'm going to use a strong word, but the kind of collective delusion that health is something that you have control over, really. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. That's a good, yes. Because truly, nobody has control over their health. You have control over what you eat, what you drink, and what you do. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, something wild could happen to you. You could get the flu and have a post-viral syndrome and end up with CFS. Right. Um, And there's literally nothing you can do to make sure that never happens. Right. So, you know, one of the mindsets that disability advocates talk about a lot is instead of pretending like we live in a society of healthy people who can just suddenly become unhealthy and like, oh, no, what happened to you? Like, we should live as a society of people who could at any point become disabled. And so we should be because honestly, at a certain point, at a certain age, you do become disabled. Mm -hmm. Like. All elderly people at some point have to rely use mobility on others, aids, yeah. rely on others, take certain medications, and if we build a society that supports that, in, that supports, you know, disabled people, uh, we uh-huh. would also be supporting healthy people because one of the biggest things is if if you have, say, a temporary injury that you don't treat. You don't Mm -hmm. get the right treatment for, that you don't get the support for, that you don't get the time to recover from. Right. That can become a permanent debilitating chronic condition that never gets better. For sure. And so, like, if instead of just treating people who become unhealthy, who become disabled, as if they're just some kind of freak case, like, oh, well, that could never happen to me, it's, it could happen to anybody. And it's, I think it's a lot more prevalent in our society than we really realize, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, and like back pain is extremely common. People just don't talk about it because mm-mm. once again, there's the idea that this is normal. Everybody deals with this. Right. And that, and it's something you just so have to work much. through and figure out mm-hmm. how, you know, ba- basically let me push myself to the brink, come home, rest on the weekend you know, barely all over again and do it all over again. Yeah. Um, Instead of trying to find ways to minimize the damage being done daily. Right. For the first year, I really thought that my health was just going to like one day I would wake up and I would start getting better. Mm -hmm. I really thought it was temporary. And then after about a year of it, it kind of sunk in that like this is possibly permanent. Like I haven't found any answers. I haven't figured out what's wrong. I'm only getting worse. I was in college. I was living in downtown Jacksonville, Florida. And my college campus was about a half a mile or a mile away. And I started not being able to walk there anymore. Mm. And that was the only place I could park my car for free. Hey, Mm. FSCJ, do better. Uh, If I was still attending, I would be fighting tooth and nail for better disability accommodations at their dorms. Right. Uh, But I'm not, and it doesn't matter. So, to me, at least. Right, right. But that was kind of the point where I went, okay, something's really, really seriously wrong with me. Right. I'm not getting better. I'm, in fact, getting worse. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure what to do about it. So I started really digging into, like, what could possibly be wrong with me. I'd already decided it probably wasn't fibromyalgia. I don't quite fit the symptom profile. Mm -hmm. I went all over the place and thought it might be all kinds of things. I eventually landed on maybe it's EDS because a lot of my symptoms were consistent with, you know, Mm -hmm. a slightly different from normal presentation. I went to a specialist. We've been through the whole diagnosis process already. But one of the things that I really had to come to terms with, especially after I got diagnosed with CFS, was this is probably the rest of my life. Like at 21... I have developed a condition which I will possibly have to live with for the rest of my life. And that came with a lot of grief. And really, with every chronic condition, even some, like, temporary chronic conditions, you do Mm -hmm. go through the five stages of grief in, like, whatever crazy order your brain needs to process it. But I definitely went through, like, anger. I still have anger sometimes Mm -hmm. and frustration and, like, you know, 
definitely denial. Uh, that was the first year was denial of like, this isn't happening. Like, right. This isn't something I'm going to have to live with. This is just going to go away. Right. Eventually, eventually I'm going to find um, the thing that fixes it. Right. Right. And yeah. then, you know, there's some bargaining of like, well, if I do this, if I do that, if I take these medicines mm-hmm. or whatever, I'll, I'll get better. Which is not how most chronic conditions work, mm-hmm. unfortunately, especially not CFS since there is so far no cure. And I've kind of gotten to the point where, and this is hard to explain to people who are mostly abled and mostly healthy, but I've gotten to the point where I've accepted, A, this could potentially be the entire rest of my life. Like, Mm -hmm. I could live to be 80 and never not have CFS. Mm -hmm. So, B, I have to create a life for myself now that is livable, Mm -hmm. like, at this level of disability. And then if I do get better, if I do go into remission, great. I'll have already created a life that is livable, livable for me at, you know, less ability. So I'll have a, an easy time of it living more, you know, when I'm less sick. But the real key with CFS is that it is whether or not you get better, it is a lifelong condition. I, even if I go into remission, it can always come back. Right. So I will never live a life that is completely like an able-bodied, healthy person mm-hmm. of my age. I just won't. And, like, I have had to come to terms with that. And other people in my life are not always ready to, like, come to terms with that. Well, I mean, it's really hard for people who've known you your whole life to think, okay, well, you're almost 22 years mm-hmm. old now. And you're going to live the rest of your life, you know, struggling to function, right. you know, when it's like, oh, well, when I was 22, I was doing this. Or when right. I was 22, I had this and, you know, it didn't matter how I felt. I just pushed through, you know, and that that is the mentality of my generation and the generation mm-hmm. before me was, you know, it didn't matter, you know, and it's really, it's really, really hard, you know, to take that mindset and go, well, is this a healthy way to look at things? You know, is this reality for this person? You know, just because you were capable of pushing through the pain that you had, does it mean that the person sitting across from you on the table, on the other side of the table is capable of doing that? And are they deficient because they can't, you know, no, it's not about whether they're able or deficient or less than, and you're better than it's, it's not about that. It's everybody has their own personal abilities and they have to be able to figure out what those are and have the freedom of judgment to be able to process through those, those things. You know, it's just like if someone had cancer, you wouldn't be, well, well, I had cancer and I still (laughs) worked 14 hours a day. So you know, I'm Ruth Gator Ginsburg and, you know, I just didn't let cancer affect me, you know? So you should be able to do that, right? No, you know, it's like everybody has their own way of dealing with things. And just because somebody else is capable of working through cancer, you know, doesn't mean that the next person will be able to do it. You know, some people don't have the choice, but to, to work through it. Right. And that's a big one too. Like a lot of people don't have any choice, but to work and have a chronic illness and boy that really grinds my gears i can tell you it's been it's been really rough at times when i've been going through pain or recovering from an injury or you know if i didn't have the support that i have now with my husband you know i would be broke yeah because i wasn't able to work enough hours to pay the bills you know he had to you know kind of compensate for some of my lost income and I don't support all of our bills anyway, but you know, <laughs> but my portion of the Every bills, yeah, I mean, my portions of the bills were needing, I wasn't able to, you know, pay as much towards them. And, you know, like I wasn't physically able to cook every night, mm-hmm. you know, the, the kids would have had to start cooking. And, you know, I mean, thankfully we live in a society that delivers groceries now. Yeah. So, you know, thank you COVID for making groceries more acceptable, to, but you still have to pay for it. Right. You know, you have to pay for that, that, you know, convenience. You know, I, I have a friend who I'm not exactly sure what all her diagnoses are, but she's very disabled and it really, really makes me upset 
how I see people treat her mm-hmm. as a less than human being when she goes out in public and that her doctor forced her into a DNR, basically, mm-hmm, and they won't remove it. Wow. They refuse to remove it because I don't know exactly know why, but we I got into an, a you know a discussion with her and I'm like, this a DNR is your choice. Right. It is not the medical community's choice. You write a letter to the board of directors at that hospital and tell them that you want your DNR removed from your chart. You know, right, um, that's... because they're like, well, once you make that decision, you can't go back on it. I'm like, that's a what? That's not true. <laughs> huh, what? Wait, what? <laughs> no, <laughs> this is not how this works. <laughs> Just because you as a hospital don't want to spend your resources on somebody you don't consider worth it doesn't mean they exactly, aren't worth it. Exactly. And it makes me so sad because she's a very kind person and I just wish I could go over there and just be like the little bull in the china cabinet that like runs over all the yeah. people that are being shit to her you know and drinking her like shit and it just frustrates me so much and it's like nobody in this world should be treated like that no matter what they're dealing with and she has visible physical disabilities that you can see and it's like being a mom of someone on the spectrum and you know what i've dealt with when someone has an invisible disability Mm -hmm. you know when you have chronic pain you know it's not always visible to everyone that what you're dealing with i look pretty healthy on the outside you know i'm I'm thin and (laughs) pale Mm -hmm. and i look perfectly healthy don't look too close in my face i have giant circles under my eyes but, like, you cannot look at somebody and have a little thing pop up in your brain that goes, oh, they're at, like, a 9 out of 10 on the pain scale right now. Like No. You, you don't – people don't have that ability. Human beings don't Mm-mm. have the ability to read other human beings. I mean, if you know somebody level. well enough and you know their normal temperament, you right. can tell. But if this person has been dealing with chronic pain since the minute you've known them – you might not even notice the fact that they're suffering, you know. I promise you I'm really good at hiding it. We, I mean, everybody, it's a protection yeah. because nobody believes you. Well, so why would like, you sit there and go, oh, my gosh, I'm in so much pain? Because all you're going to get is we'll deal with it. Right. And also it's, it's a self-protection mechanism, too, because if I am conscious of the amount of pain that I am in all the time, I would quite literally probably go insane. Oh, um, for sure. I, I can so, totally relate to that. Yeah. So yes. most people with chronic pain learn to, to some level, disconnect from their body and dissociate a little bit because otherwise you couldn't live in your body. No. Um, and, like, that's one of the things that thankfully I so far have not had to deal with, but I probably will have to deal with when I start trying to get real pain management a lot of chronic pain patients end up getting called drug seeking because we don't look like your typical person who's at an 8 out of 10 or a 9 out of 10 or even a 10 out of 10 on the pain scale when mm-hmm. we come into, you know, the emergency room or the doctor's office because we've had to deal with it so many other times. Mm-hmm. Like when I am at an eight or a nine i'm zoned out i'm on my phone i'm texting people i'm having conversations probably not verbally Mm -hmm. but i don't look like i'm in that much pain because if i broke down crying and screaming every time i was in that much pain i would run out of energy to keep existing right exactly exactly so you know we don't look like we're in that much pain and i think that's a much more common reaction to pain than doctors really acknowledge. Um, mm-hmm. The psychological shutdown. Of- right. It's a natural protective mechanism <clears throat> in your brain because yeah. you can't be aware of that much all of the time. It will literally yeah. break you. Yeah. I was um, at the point when right before I started taking the gabapentin mm-hmm. where I was like, I don't know if I can deal with one more day of this yeah. much pain. I know that feeling. Yeah. And I was like, I think, and they wouldn't do an MRI on me because I hadn't gone through six weeks of physical therapy. And I'm like, do you really think I would have this nerve pain come out of nowhere and nothing's wrong? Like, it's all in my freaking head. And and physical therapy is going to take care of the nerve pain because obviously there's nothing pressing on a nerve. So something moved. Like, this is not, I mean, like, I just don't understand insurance. I work with medical insurance 
all the time. I'm a medical coder. I get it. You know, like, but when I just you love have our medical system so much, the, it's, so it's good. It it's, treats people so well. It just don't even get me started. Mm-hmm. <sighs> so you know, it's like I had to suffer for six more weeks and lose a lot of work because of it. And right. if we would have just gone to the MRI, figured out I had, you know bulging discs Mm -hmm. we could have gotten me the therapy that actually would have worked and helped better instead of suffering for six more weeks you know it's like i i'm still in pain like right now costing the insurance company more money because you have to do more physical therapy right well i I gave up on physical therapy understandable i mean it was just it's just time constraints i mean yeah it gets to the point where it's like you have to you have to pick between working and taking care of yourself and it's like i can only do so many therapies at yeah. one time and still work a full-time job and you know maybe it's not the wisest thing to have a youtube channel and a podcast <laughs> and working on another project but you know that's my disconnect that's my you disconnect you ha- also from- have to have things that bring you joy that's one of mm-hmm. the big things i've learned because mm-hmm. i will get on my own case about being unproductive i don't have a job right now i would like to have one um, you have a part-time job i do have a part-time job <laughs> I'm so happy because I have spending money now without having to go through, like, the excruciating process of staring at my savings account and going, hmm. So when you listen to this podcast, just know that you are supporting someone that has chronic pain. You're supporting a a disabled person. You are. And, you know, I guess I am. Yeah, I guess I am kind of a disabled person, too, you know, Um, because I've been dealing with this my whole life. It's just I do the the Gen X thing and I, I... put my head down and I push through well, it. Well, and you don't have a choice. I don't. You can't make the decision that I made because no. you can't go, well, guess I'm not going to just, home. yeah, I'm just not going to work anymore and I'm going to let somebody right. else take care of my kids. That just doesn't work. Right. So, I mean, I could, I could be like, I'm not working anymore and let's go on food stamps and, you know, which is not a bad thing and I'm not judging, no. you know, but, um, How it's, choice you want to make right now. it's not something I think I could mentally handle, you know, making that choice. And, uh, you know, my work I have the ability to work as I'm able. I, you know, was able to take FMLA and take the time that I needed. You know, I do have the support of my husband that helps me with time, with finances to be able to make through those hard times, you know. And and the other thing is when you start feeling better, being able to pace yourself and not going mm-hmm. over what you're able, which I constantly do, because, you know, that's just the stubbornness of mm-hmm. our genes that we have in us. Mm-hmm. Right, Nas? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anybody in our family, except maybe, maybe Nick, has, because he also yeah. has chronic pain, right. has learned the whole, like, hey, slow down. Right. Wait a minute. Right. Maybe you should rest. Right. More. Yeah. Maybe you should look for some therapies that, you know. Maybe a word. Yeah, rest. rest. <laughs> the biggest curse word ever in society is rest. So, yeah. So, you know, that's, you know, that's my advice to people dealing with chronic pain is, you know, number one, try and get yourself some, be your own advocate yes. because nobody else is going to advocate for you. No. You are going to have to find the doctors that are going to help you. If they're not helping you, find another doctor. Mm -hmm. And I realize that's... You can doctor shop. You do not have to stay with the first doctor you go to. And this is true of therapists. This is true of every Mm -hmm. professional. Mm -hmm. Just like you would fire a plumber if they broke your toilet instead of fixing it, you can fire a doctor if they mess up your health instead of fixing it. Or if they just don't want to, you know, give you the time of day. Right, and if they're not treating you, if they're not helping you, if they're not helpful. And we, we do realize that we're speaking from privilege mm-hmm. because we do live in an area where we have a lot of access to a lot of doctors. Right, but and even, we, yeah. you know, like I'm on Medicaid right now. I don't have a lot of choice if I want to go to like a doctor that won't cost me anything. Right. But I still have some choice. It right. would be a pain to have to deal with. But I still have some choice. And, right. like, even if you can't find a great doctor, if you end up with a really bad doctor, I'm going to say something controversial, but a terrible doctor is almost worse than not having one. Right. Because somebody who isn't going to listen to you is going to push things on you that aren't going to work for you or that mm-hmm. make you worse is only going to, A, cost you money, and, B, make everything more complicated. Right. So, 
if you have a really terrible doctor and you don't have a choice, it's okay to go, you know what? Maybe I just won't see you for a while. And I'll deal with stuff for a while and then try again, maybe. Or if mm-hmm. another doctor comes into the area, try that. Yeah. A lot of people may still be uh, offering telehealth appointments. So you right. can get one of those. Yeah. Like, J- find out what your options are right. first. You know, where, what, if you have insurance, what doctors your insurance covers? Is there another option for you? You know, do you have the ability to either get a ride or afford a ride to a neighboring town that may have a doctor who works with, you know, people who have chronic pain of your diagnoses, and there's right? No shame in asking for help. No. Like that's something no. our society really, really hates. Mm-hmm. That's the other dirty four letter word, help. Right. But, and it's even hard for me. It was hard for me last year to make the decision that I. I really, I had to stop working. Mm -hmm. I had to stop doing that to myself. I was working three hour days Mm -hmm. and I still was in so much pain at the end of my work day that I would just lay in bed Mm -hmm. and think like, Mm -hmm. I can't do this again. And then I would wake up the next day and I would do it again. Yep. And some days I literally, I had to call out because I would sit there as work was approaching and go, I literally cannot handle it. Right. Um, And even still... You know, my job ended because it was connected to the election and I was trying to find another one. And I sat there going, maybe I could work a 40 hour week at a call center. And then, you know. (laughs) Yes, because the three hours a day that you struggled Uh through was not an indication of your abilities, right? And then, you know, I kind of reality checked myself and went, no, stop that. Mm -hmm. Stop that. Your independence is not worth more than your health. Right. And that's, and for some people, it may be. Like, right. not everybody is in a situation where they actually have a good option. Mm-hmm. But for me, my independence was not worth my health. Right. And you did, I mean, she has the ability to have the support to be able to get. I'm very fortunate. Our parents are in a, a position where they can mm-hmm. support me. Yeah. Um. But, you know, it's. The best advice, really, for anybody who's dealing with chronic pain or a chronic illness is do what's best for you mm-hmm. and really what's best for you. Like, mm-hmm. in your in your brain, in your heart, what you know is best for you. Mm-hmm. And just don't listen to everybody else. They don't know. Right. They don't know anything. Yeah. They don't know what it's like to live in your body. They don't mm-hmm. know what it's like to live in your mind. They don't know what it's like to live with your experiences, even people with your same condition. Right. Like, they're the closest anybody can get, but... Their experience can also be very vastly right. different. Yeah. Right. Um, but definitely, if you can, there's so much online community now, mm-hmm. and, like, the disabled community is so very online because all mm-hmm. of us are stuck in our houses. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> so go try to find online community. Like, there are places... Where are some of the places that you started so to look for a community? I found... You can find Discord servers. Um, I don't know how young the listening audience is, but they're they're. I Discord, so if I can Discord, Discord, you know, <laughs> I, I'm in a book club. We have people who are grandmothers on our on our Discord. Reddit is another place. Like, mm-hmm. don't Reddit's can be scary. But look, <laughs> look for your diagnosis. Look for you know disability. Look for. People, you know, communities specifically focused around disability and Positive your diagnosis and things people. like that. And, yeah. like, those are good resources. Those are good places. I think there are forums, too. I'm sure there's forums. Mm-hmm. Um, and most of your social medias, Tumblr has a huge disabled presence. Mm-hmm. Twitter has a bunch of disabled people if you want to be on Twitter. Um, I can't stand uh, Twitter. I can't. I, my brain can't process Twitter. Twitter is – Twitter, I avoid it. But – it, like, there are good people on there, and you can mm-hmm. avoid the the nastiness. I know there's a big presence on Instagram, too. Pretty much any Yeah, I'm sure there's some, fa- some Facebook groups. Oh, for sure. There's definitely yeah. Facebook groups. I'm yeah. not on Facebook, so I yeah. don't think about it. But yeah. there's for sure Facebook groups. Yeah. So that is finding community and people. Is there a specific hashtag on the socials um, that you tend to, to see a positive, like, dynamic around the people that you – I mean, it, it varies between social media because yeah. each 
one has a slightly different culture, but mm. I would say look under the hashtag for your diagnosis for sure. Like mm-hmm. I've found a lot of support for chronic fatigue in the CFS hashtag. Mm-hmm. Um, look spoony. That's one. Oh, um, okay. So this, I'll do the, the short and fast explanation of the spoon theory, mm-hmm. which will explain why people call themselves spoonies. Um, spoon theory was a way of explaining how energy works that someone came up with in, I believe, the 2010s, and I do not remember her name, but I'm pretty sure she's fine with it being cited without her name. But if you mm-hmm. look it up, you'll find we'll the try to origin put, of we'll, it. We'll look up the person um, and put it in the description. So basically, it's a way of explaining how it feels to have chronic illness, which is imagine that your energy is spoons. Imagine that you as an able person wake up with, let's say, 50 spoons and tasks cost a certain amount. So getting up costs a spoon, you know, making breakfast maybe costs two. Going to work and working costs, you know, probably like 20. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the end of the day, you might even still have a handful left over to cook dinner, you know, Bathe the children. Bathe the children. Do the you know, homework with the children. <laughs> um, <coughs> so you have, let's say, 50 spoons. Uh, someone with chronic illness might wake up with five. Mm-hmm. So getting out of bed costs a spoon. Making breakfast costs two. They have three spoons now. Mm-hmm. So we're like, what are you going to do now? Right. Um, what know, are you going to spin that spoon on, maybe right? Maybe on a really good day, somebody with chronic illness wakes up with 25. But even mm. still, if they're working after they've gone to work, that's it. That's right. all the spoons. Right. And so even though I try not to work past my limit, most people, and most people with chronic illness also try not to work past their limit. Sometimes you don't have a choice. Right. Like, you don't always have a choice to go, oh, I'm out of spoons, done for the day. Sometimes right. you have to go into debt and borrow spoons from future you. And that's what I used to do when I had to work, which yeah. meant that my weekends, I could do literally nothing. And right. I couldn't do anything on the days that I was working either. So nothing was ever clean. I was mm-hmm. almost always out of clothes. Mm-hmm. And it's... It's really difficult, and people don't make the connection of how drastic of a difference chronic illness makes to the amount of energy you have. And this is mm-hmm. something you can use. Like, it's people people with mental illness, physical yeah. illness, anything that impairs your ability to function and means that you have a harder time getting things done. Like, spoon theory is all access. Right, right. Um, it can be applied to a lot of diagnoses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, like, the... The biggest community I've found really is people who gather under the Spoonie yeah. umbrella because, you know, it's all sorts of different people, but we all have in common that uh, we don't function as well as other people mm-hmm. do. You and have less you have less ability or mm-hmm. spoons yeah. available to you on a given day, so when you use up your energy you are left with so much less right. available to you. Or even you're in debt. And yeah. eventually that comes knocking. Right. Hello, you have to right. pay your debt back and you're in bed for a day, mm-hmm. two days, three days, mm-hmm. a week. Yeah. And that's where I'm That's where I'm at right now is mm-hmm. figuring out how many spoons I have available. Right. You know, okay, well, you know, like I did some gardening and I'm having nerve pain this week. Oh, I guess I probably shouldn't have done as much. Maybe mm-hmm. I should have done a little bit less, you know. And then it's a constant, constant, constant math. It is. And sometimes you do more than you should on purpose. Mm-hmm. I definitely have made decisions where it's like, I know if I do this, I'm possibly going to put myself like flat out for up to a month, you know, one week of doing exertion every single day. Oh, I'm out for a month. It's a trade off. I mean, yeah. that's, it's that's what chronic pain constant cost benefit analysis yeah it it Um, is i mean and um so i think we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up for today and if you enjoyed this conversation if you would like for us i mean there's so much to unpack in this you know with chronic pain and there's disability politics oh my gosh i we don't do politics on this channel No, but I mean, not like advocating as in, for yourself. Yeah, it's yeah. politics as in uh, not necessarily 
more of like how do you it's more of a worldview okay I kind gotcha. of politics than like um a voting kind of gotcha. politics but yeah i mean i guess that's a. I mean i guess that is an important part of it though is yeah. being able to advocate for yourself through legislation too yeah i mean um, hello the <clears throat> ada only happened because we right. advocated like whew. right disability community did a lot for that absolutely absolutely and so if y'all would like to hear more about you know different aspects of dealing with chronic pain different you know i don't know what else we could talk about i mean like basically you know i could we could both talk about being an advocate because mm-hmm. I have advocated for my son who has an invisible disability and I've also had to be my own advocate lately when it comes to my chronic pain, but I actually have the ability to do that lately, which prior to this, I really just had to push through it. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, just, you know, or if there's a topic specifically that you can think of that I'm not thinking of because I still have sick brain (laughs) and brain is not functioning. You know, throw out some topics that you would like for, you know, myself and Nos to kick around and talk about because she is actually a very good wealth of information when it comes to this. She's done a lot I of have research. nothing to do but learn things. So. And she would love to learn for you. So please use her as a resource. <laughs> I really want to thank uh, Nos for joining me today. I appreciate their input. And I know I messed up on some pronouns, but I'm trying. Still learning. (laughs) I'm still still learning. learning. It's it's really like rewiring your brain, especially when you've known someone for so long. So, and I, um, but I really do appreciate you and I thank you for joining us and I thank you all for listening and we, we hope that you will join us on our next episode when we try or maybe possibly will figure it out. We'll see. Y'all have a great day. Bye.